जय राधा माधव कंजाबी हारी जय राधा माधव कंजाबी हारी गोपी जन वल्लभ गिरिवर धारी गोपी जन वल्लभ गिरिवर धारी यशोरंगंदन ब्रज जन रंजन शोरानंदन बजन रंजन वन तिरा वन चारी वन तिरा वन चारी जय राधा माधव जय राधा मार्व कुंजारी हारी जय मिस्टर पाद परमहंस रुज का चर्ज अष्टोत्तर श्री श्रीमान दिवाइन ग्रेस Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai Iskand B.B.T. Founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Parujaka Acharya Ashtotar Tadu Shri Shri Mata Divine Grace Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Ki Jai Ananda Koti Vaishnavinda Ki Jai Nama Acharya Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai Shri Mata Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai Samaveda Bhaktivinda Ki Jai all glory to the assembled devotees. All glory to the assembled devotees. All glory to the assembled devotees. All glory to Sri Guru and Goranga. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Glenn, turn this down just a mite, I think, for our friend Vijay Prabhu. On this third day of February, 2021 in San Diego, we're reading from Srimad Bhagavad Gita as it is, translation and commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And we are in Chapter 7, entitled Knowledge of the Absolute, and we're still exploring text number 15 on page 320. Na, Mam, Dushkutino, Mudha, Namam Dushkutano Mudha Papadjante Naradma Papadjante Naradma Mahiya Parita Gyana Mahiya Parita Gyana Asuram Bhavamashvita Asuram Bhavamashita Namam Dushkuti no Mudha Papadyante Naradhama Mahiya Parita Gyana Asuram Bhavamashita Namam Dushkuti no Mudha Papadyante Naradhma Mahiya Parita Gyana Asodam Bhavamashita 
कहेगा नमाम दुष्कृति नो मूढ़ा प्रपजंते नरात्मा मायया परितं ज्ञाना आसुरं भावमाश्ता नमाम दुष्कृति नो मूढ़ा प्रपजंते नरात्मा मायया परितं ज्ञाना आसुरं भावमाश्ता न नात माम अंतुमि दुष्कृत न हा मिस्क्रियंस मूड हा हा फूलिश पपद्यंते सरेंडर नरा अदमा लोएस्ट अमंग मैनकाइन माया बाय द इल्यूजरी एनर्जी अपरिता स्टोलन ज्ञाना हा हुज नॉलेज आसुरम डेमोनिक भावम नेचर आशिता हा एक्सेप्टिंग ट्रांसलेशन those miscreants who are grossly foolish, who are lowest among mankind, whose knowledge is stolen by illusion, and who partake of the atheistic nature of demons, do not surrender unto me. Now, we read part of this purport yesterday, so we'll begin on page 321. Number one, he, go, he systematically discusses each one of these uh, non devotees class. One, the mudhas are those who are grossly foolish, like hard-working beasts of burden. They want to enjoy the fruits of their labor by themselves, and so they do not want to part with them for the supreme. The typical example of the beast of burden is the ass. This humble beast is made to work very hard by his master. The ass does not really know for whom he works so hard day and night. He remains satisfied by filling his stomach with a bundle of grass, sleeping for a while under fear of being beaten by his master, and satisfying his sex appetite at the risk of being repeatedly kicked by the opposite party. The ass sings poetry and philosophy sometimes, but this braying sound only disturbs others. This is the position of the foolish fruit of worker who does not know for whom he should work. He does not know that karma, action, is meant for yajna, sacrifice. Most often, those who work very hard day and night to clear the burden of self-created duties say that they have no time to hear of the immortality of the living being. To such mudhas, material gains which are destructible are life's all in all. Despite the fact that the mudhas enjoy only a very small fraction of the fruit of, lab of labor, of their labor. <coughs> Sometimes they spend sleepless days and nights for a fruit of gain, and although they may have ulcers or indigestion, they are satisfied with practically no food. They are simply absorbed in working hard day and night for the benefit of illusory masters. Ignorant of their real master, the foolish workers waste their valuable time serving mammon. Unfortunately, they never surrender to the supreme master of all masters, nor do they take time to hear of him from the proper sources. The swine who eat the night soil, that's stool, do not care to accept sweetmeats made of sugar and ghee. Similarly, the foolish worker will untiringly continue to hear of the sense-enjoyable tidings of the flickering mundane world, but will but, but, but will have very little time to hear about the eternal living force that moves the material world. Om Jnana Timurandasya Jnanandana Shalakya Chakshu Unmiditam Mena Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama I was born in the darkest of ignorance, but my spiritual master Shri Prabhupada opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisances unto him and all members of Shri Parampara. So we're in text 15 of 7, it's 320, 320, 321. So the, uh, the, the four, these four classes, <coughs> general classes, who don't surrender to Krishna, and because they don't surrender to Krishna, they stay bound up by the material energy, the three modes of nature. Previous verse, very important verse, Daiviyesha gunamayi mamamaya dorotyaya mamevye papadyante maya me tantarantite. That this divine energy of mind, made up of the three modes of nature, is impossible to cross over uh, get out of the entanglement from on one's own. But s anyone who surrenders unto me can easily cross beyond it. So one may ask, well, why doesn't everyone surrender to Krishna? And uh, this next verse answers that. Because uh, people are too bound up and they're in great illusion. They don't know 
what the, you know what the source of their suffering is, where real pleasure is, and so and he goes through systematically these four classes. So the first is the mudha. Uh, I would I would say this is the be- biggest class. I would also say if you study carefully, they're not mutually exclusive. These classes, some there's some overlap, but the first is specifically those who are simply not much more than beasts of burden, you know, hard manual laborers who simply are focused on trying to keep it together and, and earn their pittance, whatever they can, and en- enjoy, you know, their, uh, their un- you know, mode of ignorance pleasures mostly. So, Prabhupada he compares them to the ass, the beasts of burden, the donkeys. When you go to India, you see, you remember that? When you went to India, Balaram? Did you ever see the big donkey carrying the load in Vrindavan? I remember seeing this huge load. See, how could they possibly hold that? You know, some other. So they're, they're, you know, struggling down the road. And as Prabhupada makes the point, what, what, do, what do they get out of it? You know, they're getting fed, basically, and their, their basic needs are being met. And, and Prabhupada, you know, they let, he lets them have some uh, sex. Maybe they'll get a, he'll get another ass to, to uh um, grow up and, and take the place of the, this one who is working so hard that he, you know, he expires. So it's a very um, kind of a, a pitiful life and one that is fraught with all kinds of dangers and sufferings. But such a person who is, is deeply in the mode of ignorance generally and passion most uh, doesn't have the facility or the interest to hear about the, the philosophy. It's simply focused on this, pro- this, this uh, enterprise of trying to work very hard, make enough money to pay the bills, and go on like that. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a truly, it's truly a tragic waste of human life, you know. So that's the first class. Grossly foolish, like a hard-working beast of burden. Okay. Next class are the Duskriti. Another class, this is the number two on page 322. Another class of duskriti or miscreant, so these are four classes of duskriti or miscreant, is called the naradhama, or the lowest of mankind. Nara means human being, and adhama means the lowest. Out of the 8,400,000 different species of living beings, there are 400,000 human species. Out of these, there are numerous lower forms of human life that are, that are mostly uncivilized. The civilized human beings are those who have regular principles of social, political, and religious life. Those who are socially and politically developed, but who have no religious principles, must be considered neurotomous. Nor is religion without God religion, because the purpose of following religious principles is to know the supreme truth and man's relationship with him. In the Gita, the personality of Godhead clearly states that there is no authority above him and that he is the supreme truth. The civilized form of human life is meant for man's reviving the lost consciousness of his eternal relation with the Supreme Truth, the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, who is all-powerful. And for those who don't have books, reviving the lost consciousness is in italics. Prabhupada is emphasizing that. Uh, whoever loses this chance is classified as a Naratama. We get information from revealed scriptures that when a baby is in the mother's womb, an extremely uncomfortable situation, he prays to God for deliverance and promises to worship him alone as soon as he gets out. To pray to God when he is in difficulty is a natural instinct in every living being because he is eternally related with God. But after his deliverance, the child forgets the different difficulties of birth and forgets his deliverer also, being influenced by maya, the illusory energy. <laughs> So you have a little play on words there. You know, he said a, a child was delivered, you know, the, 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 the doctor delivered the baby. <laughs> so that probably after his deliverance. And then he doesn't remember his, his real deliverer is, namely God. It is the duty of the guardians of children to revive the divine consciousness dormant in them. The ten processes of reformatory ceremonies, as enjoined in the Manusmriti, which is the guide to religious principles, are meant for reviving God consciousness in the system of Varnashram. However, no process is strictly followed now in any part of the world, and therefore 99.9% of the population is Naradama. So you can see there's got to be some overlap with the Mudas also. (laughs) When the whole population becomes Naradama, naturally all their so-called education is made null and void by the all-powerful energy of physical nature. 
According to the standard of the Gita, a learned man is he who sees on equal terms the learned Brahman, the dog, the cow, the elephant, and the dog eater. That is the vision of a true uh, devotee. Sri Nityananda Babu, who is the incarnation of Godhead as divine master, delivered the typical Naradamas, the brothers Jagai and Madhai, and showed how the mercy of a real devotee is bestowed upon the lowest of mankind. So the Naradama, who is condemned by the personality of Godhead, can again revive his spiritual consciousness only by the mercy of a devotee. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in propagating the Bhagavad Dharma or activities of the devotees, has recommended that people submissively hear the message of the Personality of Godhead. The essence of this message is Bhagavad Gita. The lowest among human beings can be delivered by the submissive hearing process only, but unfortunately they even m refuse to give an oral reception to these messages and what to speak of surrendering to the will of the Supreme Lord. Naradamas, or the lowest of mankind, willfully neglect the prime duty of the human being. So, uh, when you read these passages in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, yeah, you know, I, I was in the Radama, <laughs> and, I, and most, of, most of my associates were in the and Mudhas. It seemed to fit, fit the, the, exactly what we were doing. And, uh, <laughs> and practically the whole population is in the even though there's, there's so much profession of religion, you know, what's, it's such a distortion and a corruption. Religion is often, uh, in history, you know, re religion has been used uh, as an excuse for war, for extermination of uh, other peoples, you know. Whereas Prabhupada uh, cites this uh, verse from the fifth chapter, Vidyavinaya sampane brahmanega vihastiri shuni chai vashapaka cha pandita samadarshana. And that samadarshana, the word sama, is the same, same word, the same in English. Uh, samadarshana, a vision of equality. In other words, you see the spiritual nature of every living being. And because you're not in that exploitative mood, which is the mode of passion, how can I bring this person into my service? How can I employ them and pay them a pittance and still, you know, and suck out their life force? And, you know, it, this is the, the nature of the uh, present system we live in, built on, uh, uh, Prabhupada mentions here, worshipping mammon, right? So that this corrupts the soul of, of uh, the, the people who are suffering that, who are being exploited, and the exploiter as well. So these Naradamas, they, they, they have no clue about the goal of human life. Uh, they're very close to the Mudhas. Sometimes I've, you know, it, it seems like there's a, a big overlap there. Um, but uh, let's see, how does he define them? Uh, means the lowest, out of these numerous lower forms of human life, certainly those who have negative, regulative principles. Okay, so the Naradamas, they don't have any real regulative principles, social, political, and religious life. In other words, they're, 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 they're living in a, uh, almost like a Hobbesian, you know, Hobbesian is like uh, all against all. It's, 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 it's just a struggle for existence. There may be some civilized polish to it, but it really just covers a bestial nature. And that society can de devolve into that when there's no leaders, and that means not just the political leaders, but the teachers and the parents and people who actually train the young, uh, uh, young people, you know, and give us our values in life. When that's all corrupted and everyone is in this, uh, you know, uh, hedonistic mood, then things devolve into, into a uh, all against all. Prabhupada has this phrase in the Bhagavatam, it becomes a dungeon of demons, you know, it can, it, society can become uh, just hellish. And, and what happens is, you know, by contrast, when, when the ruler is a, a devotee, a Yudhishthira, it's described in the first canto, when Yudhishthira ruled after the war, uh, the Mahabharata war, uh, the uh, Battle of Kuchetra, uh, then nature also was, the, the demigods were also pleased. You know, the rain came at the right quantity at the right time, you know, the cows were very happy, people were satisfied. There was, a, there was a, 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 a sense of peace and happiness on the earth because of the rulers, or because of the, of the, of the Vaishnav, you know, leader. And when that's not there, people have no clue, then things degrade horribly. Arjun gives a, a sense of that in, in the first chapter. He's envisioning a society 
uh, in which uh, the women are unprotected, and therefore Barna Shankara grows up, unwanted population who have no regulation, no training. You know, that's what we have. And so it, it becomes uh, uh, much more, you know, the, uh, material life can be regulated through Varnashram and through Vaishnav uh, principles, and Manu Prabhupada mentions the Manu Smriti here, so that there's a purpose to it. So that there, you, you sense God in everything. He mentions the different uh, samskars, uh, purificatory practices that you're meant to go through. Like sometimes we hear all oh, the grain, give, the, the, the first grain ceremony, some little child is born, you know. So you get some prasadam, you know, it's the first grains. Then there's that ceremony, does he choose the Bhagavatam or does he choose the money? You know, to see, find out his propensities, you know, something like that. So there's all, there's all these, these uh, purificatory, even the, you know, conception, when the, uh, a man and wife are having conception, it's supposed to be this Garbhadan Samskara, they chant, Prabhupada simplified it, chant 50 rounds before having sex, and then you'll be in, you know, because the, 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 the science is that the consciousness of the man and the woman, they attract a certain kind of soul to be born, you know. If it's just like, you know, the backseat of a car or something, then you can imagine what the, you know, you know what the uh, progeny is going to be. Uh, I always wondered, you know, because of course I never got married, is that after 50 rounds of Hare Krishna, you're really going to be inclined to have sex. <laughs> but I guess, it, it, you know, if it's the, the mode is, okay, we're going to have a child, raise him as a devotee, you know. This, what did Krishna say in this chapter, just a few verses back? Dharma varu dobu deshu kamasmi bhada I am that sex life which is not contrary to religious principles. Prabhupada defines it in the purport when the purpose is having, you know, a Vaishnav upbringing. You know, that's wonderful. So there's a proper way of doing everything. And when that, that, that ignorance reigns and there's no, this, this science is not being taught, then society degrades. And Kali Yuga is going to degrade, you know. And the Krishna consciousness movement, starting with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it's going to push back on the progress of the Kali Yuga. It was 500 years into it, you know, and now it's flourished all over, it's going all over the, the globe. And uh, it, said, it is said, and in Shastra, there'll be a 10,000 year uh, period when Lord Chaitanya's movement will reign and it'll be... And uh, we can't see how it's going to happen. I mean, it's great, the movement is, you know, the, 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 the TLVP is being built and so many things, but it just seems like... You know, things are degrading so fast outside. So we leave it up to Krishna. You can do miracles. Okay, moving on. Um, if, if there are any comments or questions on this, this is a long purpose. We have uh, a couple of more categories here to, to uh, deal with. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Bhavad Anavai. A question or a question. comment? Uh, a quick question. Uh, it's when you, uh, it says four million, I mean eight million four hundred thousand species, and four hundred thousand species are human. Yeah. Uh, humans. So what is what does that mean? Would you please explain? Uh, well, it doesn't mean the, the, the word species doesn't mean in in the vocabulary we have it. The prophet gave that that word. Um, uh, it's not exactly what what you'll find in the biology books. In fact, they recognize one species, Homo sapiens, of human beings. And to just make it more interesting and more intriguing, there's a verse in the Bhagavatam that says there's one species of human life. Go figure. I have no idea how to, how to reconcile that with the 400,000. Um, so it's not, it's not the, 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 the safest thing is that it's not the same way of determining species as we have, as you find in the uh, universities and the books of... Uh, human biology like that. But, the, but you can see how many varieties of human beings there are, you know, and even within uh, what you think, well, this is one, you know, variety, there are also so many sub-varieties, and somehow that comes out to 400,000. I don't know more than that. I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. Thank you. Okay. I, oh, thanks. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So let's go on to the Maya Parita Gyanas. The next class of Duskriti is called the Maya Parita Jnana, or those persons whose erudite knowledge has been nullified by the influence of illusory material energy. They, they are mostly very learned fellows, great philosophers, poets, literati, scientists, etc. 
but the illusory energy misguides them, and therefore they disobey the Supreme Lord. There are a great number of Maya Purita Jnana at the present moment, even amongst the scholars of the Bhagavad Gita. In the Gita, in plain and simple language, it is stated that Sri Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There is none equal to or greater than him. He is mentioned as the father of Brahma, the original father of all human beings. In fact, Sri Krishna is said to be not only the father of Brahma, but also the father of all, all species of life. He is the root of the impersonal Brahman and Paramatma. The super soul in every unit entity is his plenary portion. He is the fountainhead of everything, and everyone is advised to surrender unto his lotus feet. Despite all these clear statements, the Maya Aparita Jnana de uh, deride the personality of the Supreme Lord and consider him merely another human being. They do not know that the blessed form of human life is designed after the eternal and transcendental feature of the Supreme Lord. All the unauthorized interpretations of the Gita by the class of Maya Aparita Jnana outside the purview of the Parampara system are so many stumbling blocks on the path of spiritual understanding. The deluded interpreters do not surrender unto the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, nor do they teach others to follow this principle. So Prabhupada was more or less engaged in a battle with these uh, scientists, philosophers, and misinterpreters of the Bhagavad Gita throughout his preaching career. And uh, it, it, it's, gonna, it's a, a constant battle. And this is why you know, Srila Prabhupada wrote this book. He was so anxious to have the full, unabridged version of the Bhagavad Gita come out. Because the Bhagavad Gita is, is revered even in the West. In the 19th century, there was a, a class of philosophers called the uh, Transcendentalists. Emerson was there, Thoreau, and others. And uh, they, they got hold of a translation of Bhagavad Gita. Because you remember, the English are ruling India, uh, British Raj, and there's always an intelligent class, intellectuals, who want to investigate. And so they, some studied Sanskrit, and they gave their translation, interpretation. And so the Bhagavad Gita had become known in the West. But, as Prabhupada uh, you know, never fails to point out, because no one really knew what the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita was, they weren't learning the Bhagavad Gita from a person whose life and soul is the Bhagavad Gita. They were trying to figure it out on their own. Uh, they universally miss the point. And I, I, you know, remember reading Bhagavad Gita. It was just a translation. It was like a little paperback. And uh, if, when, after you read through it, you still couldn't, there's no question of, now I know what to do with my life. No. It's, it just, you need to have the explanation. It has to come through. Otherwise, it remains opaque. So, aside from uh, those so-called scholars of the uh, Bhagavad Gita and uh, so forth, there's all kinds of uh, other, uh, you know, fields of philosophy and uh, speculation and all kinds of things that the, your mind can get involved in. And I, you know, was involved in that. I mean, I was into Western philosophy before I even discovered anything about Eastern philosophy. And I would study, you know, the Socrates. I even took some courses in college when I was young, uh, 17, 18. My brother was into it. And... Uh, you know, I know now that I was looking for this. I was looking for the absolute truth. And you get a certain hint of it. Like Prabhupada, he, he, uh, there's a book we have. I don't know if you've ever distributed them. I saw them on, the, on one of the pictures of the tables out there, the uh, Beyond Illusion and Doubt. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever looked through it. But we have, some, you know, Prabhupada would discuss these philosophers. He had uh, Hayagriva and Shamasunda. They had studied some of that in school, and they carried a book with them, and they would give him a little summary of the philosophies of the different philosophers, and Prabhupada would comment. And it was all recorded, trans, you know, transcribed, and I did a bunch of work on it, and others did. So, uh, but there's always some flaw. Now, some are, d are much better than others, you know, closer. Prabhupada likes Socrates, you know. Socrates apparently was firmly convinced that he wasn't the body, that he was a soul. And you have to realize, you know, uh, Greece is pretty close to India. And people would travel and they would get some of the same ideas and preaching, you know. So uh, Prabhupada tells the story uh, how uh, he had he'd, he'd read about it, or maybe when he was discussing this Socrates, that he, w he got in trouble because he was supposedly polluting the, uh, the youth, 
you know, he was teaching them about the soul and transmigration and other things. And so that was somehow, they saw it as seditious. So they arrested him. And they uh, sent him to death, you know, by drinking hemlock, poison, famous. So Prabhupada says, you know, you heard, heard the story. They said, well, uh, now we're going to, you know, now we're going to, uh, you know, you have to get, drink this hemlock and die. So, this, so he, he said, uh, you can uh, you can kill me if you can catch me, or something like that. In other words, meaning that I'm the soul. You may kill the body, but you're not going to kill me. And he was firmly convinced of that. So Prabhupada really liked that. And there's some others who had some, some good aspects. But of course, there was always some deficiency, because they didn't understand Krishna in full. So the idea is that aside from these you know, famous philosophers, everybody's a philosopher now. You know, you can get your own, make your own philosophy with this this site from this site and this site and then you've got your world view uh, but without the the, the 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 truth you know Prabhupada gives the example of the parampara the disciplic succession being like you have this valuable ripened fruit mango at the top of the tree you know so you want to bring it down and uh, taste it so you don't just go up there and throw and throw it down because it may fall on the ground and get spoiled and break to break apart you know so you have to carefully hand it down as it is so that it can be relished as it, you know, the value of it. So similarly, this knowledge is so esoteric. It's so confidential. Uh, it cannot be understood by just anybody, no matter how great your IQ is. That's why at the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita and also, you know, when, the, when uh, Arjun surrenders, that's when Krishna starts speaking to him, when he's in the proper mood of reception. Otherwise, they're speaking one-on-one -on -one like friends. And at the beginning of the Bhagavatam, you have this, uh, this, this Bhagavatam is the ripened fruit of the tree of the Vedic knowledge. And then in the second verse, it is said, uh, the previous verse, it says, uh, it, for, for one who receives it in the mood of surrender, because uh, shushu sho means uh, submissive all reception, Prabhupada said, uh, in the proper mood, as, as it says in fourth chapter, is through service, surrender, and inquiry, then Krishna is manifest in the heart of such a person from hearing the philosophy of Bhagavatam. And, uh, you know, one can really benefit from the knowledge. So, this, uh, these Maya Aparita Jnana, their knowledge has been stolen away by Maya, but they still uh, can present something to the innocent people. You know, whole spin out, whole philosophies and, and, and theories of how things are going on. And this is the most dangerous thing in society because people uh, accept that as truth, they live by it, and then their, their life is spoiled. So that's, uh, this is a large group. Uh, as Prabhupada says, there are many, great number of Maya Pradhyanas at the present moment. So Prabhupada would, you know, whenever possible, he would meet with them, he would meet with professors, he would go to, you know, schools, he, would, he famously went to MIT once in the in technology, very famous, you know. And he asked them after giving a talk, where, where is your department in the school to study the soul? You know, and, and, and there is no department. But it's the most important subject of matter that it can be. So this is the another big class in society that's not Krishna conscious. Okay, uh, last class of the Diskritis are called the Asudam Bhavam Ashita. Those of demonic principles. This class is openly atheistic. Some of them argue that the Supreme Lord can never descend upon this material world. But they are unable to give any tangible reason as to why not. There are others who make him subordinate to the impersonal feature, although the opposite is declared in the Gita. Envious of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the atheist will present a number of illicit incarnations manufactured in the factory of his brain. Such persons whose very principle of life is to decry the personality of Godhead cannot surrender unto the lotus feet of Krishna. Sri Yamunacharya Alabandaru of South India said, O oh my Lord, you are unknowable to persons involved with atheistic principles despite your uncommon qualities, features, and activities, despite your personalities being confirmed by all the revealed scriptures in the quality of goodness, and despite your being acknowledged by the famous authorities renowned for their depth of knowledge in the transcendental sci uh, science and situated in the godly qualities. Therefore, one, the grossly foolish persons, two, the lowest of mankind, three, the deluded speculators, and four, the professed atheists, as above mentioned, never surrender unto the lotus feet of the, per of the personality of Godhead, in spite of all scriptural and authoritative advice. 
So one note about the uh, speculative philosophers. Um, now, after, the w after World War II, there was a, a big uh, upsurge of atheism. Prabhupada tells us about how the ladies in Germany, you know, they would send their sons, their husbands, their brothers, and their parents, their fa fathers sometimes off to war, and they would go to the church every day and pray very fervently that they come back safe and sound. And, of course, many of them didn't. And so many of them, and many of them became atheists. But even among the, the, the uh, philosophical class, there was this upsurge of existentialism, which is an atheistic philosophy. Um, and there came, there, there was this uh, slogan. You probably heard it, you probably would talk about it sometimes in the lectures and sometimes in the books, that God is dead. Oh, this is now God is dead, you know. So, so probably, you know, say, well, God is not dead, you know. Of course. Uh, what that what that means is is that here that he was never alive. If God if God is dead, it means that he was never alive. Uh, whoever they were they were thinking was God was not God because he can't die. He, you know uh, what it mean, what that means is is that these are atheist pe philosophers who are saying that God was simply a con construct in society of people who felt they needed some. God figure to worship or to rely on, you know. But now, with the war and the, the upsurge of technology and science, now we know that, you know, we don't need God anymore. And so the idea of God is dying. People are becoming more and more atheistic. Uh, not that, you know, some kind of <laughs> God that, you know, we would worship uh, has actually died. That can't, can't be. But what it means is that uh, God was always uh, a, a figment of imagination, and now people are realizing, and so God, you know, which is just an idea, is now dying out, and people are becoming more atheistic. And it, it, it uh, you know, it, it hasn't been, a, it hasn't been a uh, so obvious over, the, you know, the, the decades. People are still hanging up, hanging on to the conception of God in many ways. But certainly, a commitment to traditional religions is 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 ending, is is decreasing a lot in the United States. In Europe, it increased much more. Uh, much more rapidly, and I might understand. I didn't spend much time in France and, and England, but uh, it took a, a, a longer time for that to happen in America. But it's happening now. Younger people coming up, you know, if they're not becoming Hare Krishnas, many of them are saying, "We don't belong to any religion." I'm, you know, I, I'm a spiritual person or whatever like that, right? But who's who's really now going reg religiously to church on Sundays with their parents? You know, probably not that many. Fewer each year. So, uh, it, it, you know, the upsurge of atheism, it's, it's a dangerous time, but Krishna consciousness is, you know, pushing back, and we can do our, our best to push it forward. Okay, any discussion on the remainder of this purport? We can uh, go forward. Now, that was who doesn't worship me. Now he has four who do worship him, you know. Uh, text 16. Chatur Vidhab Jante Mam Jana Sukriti No Jana Arto Jigyasur Artarti Gani Cha Bharatashabha. Our best among the Bharatas, four kinds of pious men begin to render devotional service unto me the distressed, the desire of wealth, the inquisitive, and he who is searching for knowledge of the Absolute. Purport. Unlike the miscreants, these are adherents of the regulative principles of the scriptures, and they are called sukritina, as opposed to dushkritina in the previous verse. Sukritina are those who obey the rules and regulations of scriptures, the moral and social laws, and are more or less devoted to the Supreme Lord. Out of these, there are four classes of men those who are sometimes distressed, those who are in need of money, those who are sometimes inquisitive, and those who are sometimes searching after knowledge of the absolute truth. These persons come to the Supreme Lord for devotional service under different conditions. These are not pure devotees because they have some aspiration to fulfill in exchange for devotional service. Pure devotional service is without aspiration and without desire for material profit. The Bhakti Samadha Sindhu 1.1.11 defines pure devotion thus, Anyabhilashita shunyam jnana karma janavritam anukulyena krishnanu shilanam bhaktaruttama Okay, so what we'll do with all these verses, I'll chant them, 
And if you want to chant along, you can chant with me. So let's do that now. And those who don't need to chant or cannot, you know, you don't have to chant. Anyabilashita shunyam. No, you'll chant along with me. That way we'll save time. Anyabilashita shunyam. Jnana karma dhyanavratam. Anukulyena krishnanu. Shilanam bhaktaruttama. One should render transcendental loving service to the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, favorably and without desire for material profit or gain through food of activities or philosophical speculation. That is called pure devotional service. When these four kinds of persons come to the Supreme Lord for devotional service and are completely purified by the association of a pure devotee, they also become pure devotees. As far as the miscreants are concerned, for them, devotional service is very difficult because their lives are selfish, irregular, and without spiritual goals. But even some of them, by chance, when they come in contact with a pure devotee, also become pure devotees. Those who are always busy with fruit of activities come to the Lord in material distress and at, the t at that time associate with pure devotees and become, in their distress, devotees of the Lord. Those who are simply frustrated also come sometimes to associate with the pure devotees and become inquisitive to know about God. Similarly, when the dry philosophers are frustrated in every field of knowledge, they sometimes want to learn of God, and they come to the Supreme Lord to render devotional service and thus transcend knowledge of the impersonal Brahman and the localized Paramatma and come to the personal conception of Godhead by the grace of the Supreme Lord or his pure devotee. On the whole, when the distressed, the inquisitive, the seekers of knowledge, and those who are in need of money are free from all material desires, and when they fully understand that material remuneration has nothing to do with spiritual improvement, they become pure devotees. As long as such a purified stage is not attained, devotees in transcendental service to the Lord are tainted with fruit of activities, the search for mundane knowledge, etc. So one has to transcend all this before one can come to the stage of pure devotional service. So, uh, I think oftentimes, you know, people who become members of the Hare Krishna movement, you're coming at first to usually in one of these categories. I know many devotees, I know myself, I was in a distressed condition, but I was also uh, inquisitive about the absolute truth. I'd already read one of the, you know, the Krishna book and the uh, teaching of Lord Chaitanya, and so there was a mixture of motives. But usually it's, uh, you know, it's not just that, you know, you're, you're at the stage where you really want to learn about pure devotional service. <laughs> uh, you're probably what is such a genius, you know, the whole Sunday feast program. You know, people come for the kirtan. They don't know why they like it, but it's celebration is pure, it's, you know, it's like, they like the deities, they certainly like the prasadam, you know. And most importantly, the devotees, if they're very friendly, they make a friend, you know, and they come to see... So, but the point is, something or other brings them into the association of devotees. And that's where real advancement comes. So, because everything is always in flux. You know, y we, don't, we don't want to pigeonhole people. This person is Naradama. <coughs> that's it, you know. And, and give them like a, a tattoo on their head, you know. You're Naradama, but that's it forever. No, we're not into that. The whole thing is, there's a transformation taking place. <laughs> Right? Yes, you, many of us start out as Naradamas and miscreants and no accounts and mudhas. Uh, but the whole point is that that's not us. That's our conditioning. You know, we are in ourselves pure. There's this nice little phrase, there's those wonderful little phrases, you know, it's nice to know. Asango hyayam purushaha. This is from the Upanishads, I don't know which one. Which means that the purusha, the living entity, doesn't really associate with the material world. You know, we remain pure. But because we're so minute and because we're deluded, we identify with all of this impurity and we, we, we act in an impure, impure way. Our consciousness remains impure. But in and of ourselves, we always have that uh, uh, capacity of becoming purified and really reawakening our real uh, nature. So that's what this is all about. Here, there's four people, who, four categories who are sukriti. And... Uh, they, uh, what does it say? They worship me, you know. It doesn't say that they surrender fully to me. They worship me. Uh, and, and as we've seen, it may not be the full uh, understanding of what Krishna is. People who go to church, you know, pious people, you know, they, they go and they, they pray for something. Oh, my, my husband came down with this disease. Please cure him, you know, a million different things. So there's some piety there. That's the sukriti. 
But it, without uh, the intervention or the association with an actual devotee of Krishna, they'll stay on that platform. You know? And unfortunately, because there's no real knowledge and no teachings and so forth, they can still perform all kinds of sinful activities thinking that they're you know, very religious persons. You know, I mean, the, uh, anyway, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. So, so that, uh, especially in today, now here you have, they come to me, mom. You know, this is an important, important point. To really, uh, th there are so many vague understandings of the absolute personality of God. Here, Christians, they come in touch with me. So that, I always think of, oh, someone comes to the temple. They see the deity. They hear the pure name, the Hare Krishna mantra chanted. And so, no matter the motive that brought them there, the transformation has begun. And if they keep coming and they apply their intelligence, then they can become delivered. And most of us are in that category. Many of us. I was. Uh, so, uh, so that's why they're all Sukriti, because they're coming to Krishna. But unfortunately, there's so many, uh, you know, adharmas that are being presented as dharma. Prabhupada's always, you know, he, he always um, stresses this point. What is real dharma? We were talk, you're talking about that. It's, you know, it's throughout the Bhagavatam. Dharma misakshat bhagavat pranitam. Real dharma is enunciated by the Lord himself. You know, and those who are his true representatives, the best of whom are the Mahajans. This is in the same section of Bhagavatam. They're carrying the dharma. They're not creating it. They're not, you know, uh, emanating it. That's from Krishna. But they're applying it within society. And they're, uh, I probably would say, uh, transparent medium, media. They're, they're, they're channeling it and, and, and presenting it in such a way for a time and circ circumstance and audience that's just right. This is a real Acharya, you know, and, and the great souls. So, but the, but the real Dharma is coming from Krishna. But there's so much distortion of that. Ku Dharma, Apa Dharma, you know, Kaitava Dharma. And, and so that's, Kali Yuga is full of all that. So there's a real battle to present it. And this movement is meant that any person who approaches Krishna for any of these motives, uh, then, they, then they should really get a dose of the real thing, uh, Krishna consciousness, so that they can be benefited. And that their confused and sometimes uh, corrupt motives become purified in association with devotees. Because they, they have some religious uh, leaning. Unlike those other four, you know, who are generally hardcore and it's hard to really uh, help them if they stay in that mood. Okay, let's see what else we have. So now he, uh, he, he, we're coming up on another really, really important verse, 19, and the lead up is this uh, 17 and 18, which play off 16. Tesham gani nitya yukta eka bhakti vishishyate priyahe jnani no tyartam aham satchamama priyaha Of these, the one who is in full knowledge and who is always engaged in pure devotional service is the best, for I am very dear to him and he is dear to me. Purport, free from all contaminations of material desires, the distressed, the inquisitive, the penniless, and the, se the penniless and the seeker after supreme knowledge can all become pure devotees. But out of them, he who is in knowledge of the absolute truth and free from all material desires becomes a really pure devotee of the Lord. And of the four orders, the devotee who is in full knowledge and is at the same time engaged in devotional services, the Lord says, the best. By searching after knowledge, one realizes that his self is different from his material body. And when further advanced, he comes to the knowledge of impersonal Brahman and Paramatma. When one is fully purified, he realizes that his constitutional position is that is to be the eternal servant of God. So by association with pure devotees, the inquisitive, the distressed, the seeker after material amelioration, and the man in knowledge all become themselves pure. But in the preparatory stage, the man who is in full knowledge of the Supreme Lord and, and is at the same time executing devotional service is very dear to the Lord. He who is situated in pure knowledge of the transcendence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is so protected in devotional service that material contamination cannot touch him. So, Krishna seems to be speaking here, okay, this is a pure devotee. So, uh, <laughs> is it, there's someone who's very, very far along when he surrenders to Krishna, you know, and this will become clear in, in, in text 19. You know, the, the jnani, someone after many, many births, 
of cultivating knowledge, he who is truly wise surrenders unto me, knowing that there's nothing beyond me. So that's what we should try to come, uh, come to. These books, you know, Prabhu was so eager that we read these books. He started this, the, the, the Bhakti Shastri and the different levels, Bhakti Vaibhava and what was some of the others. You know, to, if you study so many of Srila Prabhupada's books, he wanted us to become scholars of his books because he had worked so hard to present them and he, and he knew that if someone really understands and, and, and uh, especially teaches the knowledge in the books, then you become on a very firm foundation in your devotional service. Because don't, uh, you have to always remember that everything depends on the faith, the quality of your faith. And that faith is nourished by studying the books, discussing them, and applying them. Then, then uh, what happens is that you see the results. You feel the results. And you, you, your, your doubts, which are always trying to uh, undermine your enthusiasm, are wiped away from by cultivation of this knowledge. So these classes, this is why I've tried to maintain this class. I think, Balaram, you can attest that we're trying to keep this going all the time whenever I'm in town. Bhagavad Gita class. Prabhupada did one of the you know, morning and evening classes. So the evening has become uh, less emphasized, but I know Prabhupada wants it, and uh, we'll continue to do it as long as I can. Okay, so uh, uh, any discussion? Don Avari, any uh, points of uh, comments or questions? No, Prabhu, thank you. Wonderful, very nice. Uh, <laughs> all the slokas, very nice. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Okay. Speaking of slokas, uh, I thought I'd uh, end with a couple of my favorites. Uh, because, with, you know, we're, we're, we're discussing uh, in, the, in the fourth canto, and it's, we always come back to it, as Krishna will come back, is to absorb the mind in, in Krishna. You know, that's like the first thing, manmana, to think of Krishna. So there's so many wonderful ways of doing it. Now one is to get into the, you know, Bhagavad Gita and work on memorizing verses, chanting chapters. You get the whole flow of the argument that Krishna is giving, you know. And this is a wonderful thing. Vaishashika Prabhu recommends it. What is it? What is it? The Chad program? Chapter a day, <laughs> you know. So Prabhupada has given us the... The, the facility, you know, he gives us all of these synonyms, you know, great effort and, you know, and, and, and how to pronounce. So we should take advantage of that. And throughout the Bhagavatam, there's so many wonderful prayers and Gitas. There's, I just opened up a, an old BTG. I don't, know, I don't think it's the current one. But it had a whole list of the different Gitas in the, in the Bhagavatam. The, the Bhumi Gita in the 12th Canto, the Uddhava Gita, of course, you know, and the, the different Gopi Gitas. There's one called the Gopi Gita. So all of those are like self-contained. You know, there's the Ayla Gita, which wasn't actually mentioned there. It was a real strong uh, a song of renunciation. <laughs> so these are all meant for us to absorb. And if you can, memorize, read, and discuss, and get absorbed. So I thought I'll share a few of these wonderful vibrations, just ways of remembering Krishna, glorifying Krishna, sharing Krishna, and staying Krishna conscious. So uh, the, the Venu Gita is very famous. And it starts out, uh, kind of introduction, the rainy season is over and autumn has come. So everything has become very purified, you know, the waters, the, the, the rivers have become very clean, you know, and you have the beautiful sunshine. So it starts at Kusamata Bhandada Dishishme Bringa, Vidjikula Gushta Saraksadin Mahidram, Madhapada Vagaya Chari Hinga Sahapasupada Balashtaku Javenam, Parha Pidam Natavada Vapu Karna Yokarnikaram. Bimbran Vasa Kanaka Kapisham by Jayanting Chamalam. Run run vain or other the Sudeha poor the young goat of Rinda Vrinda Ranyam Sopoda Damanam Pabishad Gi the Kirti. Now, in chanting these verses, sometimes it's thinking this is the uh, video, you know, it's a whole program, video and audio. They didn't have it, you know, you just carry it with you. It, it's just, it's, it's a meditation for the mind, you know. So what does it mean? It means the uh, lakes, and, uh, Vindavans, rivers, lakes, and hills, ring out with rang out with charming hums and trills as flocks of birds and maddened bees rejoice among the flowering trees. To those idyllic woods and glens, repairs go Now you have to know the English language. The word repair, believe it or not, can also mean go. So Krishna's going. He went into the forest, but you need I needed two syllables, so he's repaired. Uh, to those idyllic woods and glens, repairs Govinda with his friends, Sri Rama 
and the coward boys to taste the most exquisite joys. And as they walk along the way, absorbed in herding and in play, Sri Krishna, beauty absolute, begins to blow his mystic flute. With peacock plume upon his head and fragrant flower on each ear, he enters Brother's woods with tread sublime, a dancer without peer. His golden yellow raiment glows, his garland reaches to his knees, and from his lips the nectar flows and fills his flute with melodies. As Krishna thus begins his day with friends who sing his glory sweet, he beautifies the forest way with fine impressions of his feet. Uh, Samadhi culminates in this. To always see this scene of bliss within oneself and outside too. May, give, may Krishna give this boon to you. So that last part is from the Krishna book. Prabhupada calls it, this is real transcendental meditation. He doesn't say, mention the, you know, the, the whole thing that grew up around transcendental meditation. But this is real transcendental meditation. And he, you know, he worked so hard, gave us the Krishna book, so we can uh, relish these uh, vibrations. And in this way, we remember Krishna. You said, uh, very nice, uh, one of my favorite slogans, Badaha Pidam Nata Varavapo. You like that? That way you know it by heart. Excellent. Okay. Yes, my father taught me when I was young, uh, when I was a child. Nice. So now you can learn the English poem. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. you send, me, send, me, send me an email. I'll send it to you. And then I want to. Thank you. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare All glories to Shri Prabhupada.